Hi guys. Well, I've got a thousand subs. And I thank each and every one of you. I genuinely do. I can't believe it. I'm in a sort of um, bit of a state of shock, to be honest. I mean, um, I spent a lot of time with just like 80 subs, 100 subs, because I was very niche as a sky watcher. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a retrospective video. But I thought that for the time being, I'd do a bit of a self-indulgent one. Now, I've been researching Jack the Ripper for about 20 odd years now and strangely my dad's into it as well um me and my dad have always had a very sort of like shaky relationship but we both got into jack the ripper and um, we read loads of books i mean i've only got these left he's got a load and i've lent loads out and they haven't got back to me but um what i'm going to do is i'm going to concentrate on this book because i think this guy bruce robinson has cracked it but um, before I do that, I'll look at um, the victims, the story, some of the suspects and just sort of do a little bit of chat around it and also introduce my theory that um, he had an accomplice. And I've got um, a suspect for that. So this book here sort of ties in to this book here my dad and myself thought that this guy here was the ripper for quite a while we were a bit tentative about it these books here this is a complete history it's got loads of like all the information all the letters sent and similarly this one is a sort of a source book an encyclopedia but we've had other books he's got a load of books um there's actually a book called The Maybrick Diaries that I had, which is great. But that seems to have completely disappeared. Books tend to disappear, don't they? So, on with the show. Right, guys. So, um, this is um, tastebook.org, which is like the go-to site for Jack the Ripper. And um, they've got everything on here. But they are biased. They have five victims that they believe were the canonical victims that he did. Whereas quite a lot of other women are contenders. And Bruce Robinson goes into all of that in his book. So this is a brief review of the Jack the Ripper murders that occurred in London more than 100 years ago. Much of the original evidence gathered at the time has been lost and many facts are actually opinions by the various writers who have written about the case during the past century. Many aspects of the case are therefore contested and so what follows is a summation of the case in general. There are many books available to the student of crime who wish to grapple with the many mysteries associated with the case. Jack the Ripper is the popular name given to a serial killer who killed a number of prostitutes in the East End of London in 1888. The name originates from a letter written by someone who claimed to be the killer, published at the time of the murders. The killings took place within a mile area and involved the districts of Whitechapel, Spitterfields, Aldgate and the City of London proper. He was also called the Whitechapel Murderer and Leather Apron. Okay, right, so there has been reams written. There's a forum on here which is just goes on and on and on. It just goes into everything. They look at everything there is to look at. It's an industry. They don't want to find the killer, do they? Not really. Won't be able to sell their books and make any more films. and So there's like... Um, These are like the main ripperologists who are known and respected in the field and um, Bruce Robinson isn't there. But he pulls them to bits. He doesn't like the way they um, only have these five women 
and he doesn't like how they discount a lot of what he considers to be important evidence. But that's their stuff, isn't it? This is still a good place for information. So Jack the Ripper has remained popular for a lot of reasons. He was not the first serial killer, but he was probably the first to appear in a large metropolis at a time when the general populace had become literate and the press was a force for social change. Oh, I don't know if the general populace were literate at that time. I don't know if most of them were. Um, it was a, this was the time of the orphanages. You know, was, I think a lot of these um, destitute women orphans, you know, distraction, wasn't it? You know, at a time of political turmoil, um, there's both for the liberals and social reformers, as well as the Irish home rule partisans who tried to use the crimes for their own ends. Every day the activities of the Ripper were chronicled in the newspapers, as were the results of the inquiries and the actions taken by the police. Even the feelings of the people living in the East End and the editorials that attacked the various establishments of society appeared each day for both the people of London and the whole world to read. It was the press coverage that made this series of murders a new thing, something that the world had never known before. The press was also partly responsible for creating many myths surrounding the Ripper, and ended up turning a sad killer of women into a bogeyman, who has now become one of the most romantic figures in history. The rest of the responsibility lies with the Ripper. He may have been a sexual serial killer of a type all too common in the 1900s, but he was also bent on terrifying a city and making the whole world take notice of him by leaving his horribly mutilated victims in plain sight. Lastly, the Ripper was never caught, and it is the mystery surrounding this killer that both add to the romance of the story and creating, create an intellectual puzzle that people still want to solve. Absolutely, I like an intellectual puzzle. The Maybrick Diaries, though, were the ones that um, sort of hit it for me. We'll come to them in a minute. Right, so, it's unclear how many he did kill. Um, murders of prostitutes, apparently, was very common back then. People were just found dead all over the place, and the screams of murder and rape were common and often ignored. It's just, you know... <sighs> so, Marianne Nichols murdered Friday, August 31st, 1888. Annie Chapman murdered Saturday, September the 8th, 1888. Elizabeth Stride murdered Sunday, September the 30th, 1888. And Catherine Eddowes, this was like a the double murder, murdered the same date. Elizabeth Stride was found first. So, Mary Jane Kelly murdered Friday, November the 9th, 1888. And Mary Jane Kelly was the one who was horribly mutilated. It was just absolutely ghastly. Completely went to town. Totally sort of like signed off with a flourish. So besides these five, there are good reasons to believe that the first victim was Martha Tabram who was murdered Tuesday, August the 7th, 1888, and there are important considerations for questioning whether Stride was a Ripper, a Ripper victim, because there was a very short amount of time between the murder of Elizabeth Stride and the murder of Catherine Eddowes. Yeah? And there was a bit of a distance, but everything was done in this little area here, yeah? So that was, this is the double murder. So Elizabeth Stribe was found here. And then Catherine Eddowes was found here. But that's where my theory of there being um, an accomplice comes in. Genuinely. Yeah. I'll we'll get to that later. So. Oh, his method of killing them was pretty awful um, <sighs> surprisingly a full understanding of the Ripper's modus operandi was not established until several years ago the Whitechapel murderer and his victims stood facing each other when she lifted her skirts the victims hands were occupied and was then defenseless the Ripper seized the women by their throats and strangled them until they were unconscious if not dead 
The autopsies constantly reveal clear indications that the victims have been strangled. In the past, many believed that the ripper struck from behind. This is an awkward arrangement. I always thought it was from behind. Yeah, I must admit. He then lowered his victims to the ground, their heads to his left. This has been proven by the position of the bodies in relation to walls and fences that show that there was virtually no room for the murderer to attack the body from the left side. No bruising on the back of the heads shows that he lowered the bodies to the ground rather than throwing them or letting them fall. Given the inclement weather and filth, it is unacceptable that the prostitutes or their client would have attempted intercourse on the floor. When, when the prostitutes had sex, they just lifted up their skirts and bent over, I would have thought. You know, genuinely, or, you know, front to front, or the other way. Just makes sense, doesn't it? All those skirts, all that crap. Splatter stains show that the blood pooled beside or under the neck and head of the victim rather than the front, which is where the blood would flow if they had been standing up. Oh, he might have. You see, in one case, blood was found on the fence some 14 inches or so from the ground and opposite the neck wound, and this shows that the blood spurted from the body while in the prone position on the ground. This method also prevented the killer from being unduly bloodstained. Means that he was behind her, yeah. By reaching over from the victim's right side to cut the left side of her throat, the blood flow would have been directed away from him, which would have reduced the amount of blood in which he would have been exposed. If the victim was already dead before their throats were cut, then the blood spilt would not have been very much. Mm. So he strangled them and then cut their throats but they must have still been alive because the blood flew, flowed it just doesn't make sense that does it With the heart no longer beating the blood would not have been pressurized so only the, the blood in the immediate area of the wound would have been evacuated gently near the cuts the ripper then made his other mutilations still from the victim's right side or possibly while straddling over the body or at or near the feet in several cases the legs were pushed up to shorten the distance between the abdomen and the feet no sign of intercourse was ever detected usually took a bit of the victim's viscera that sits inside making of taking of a trophy is a common practice by modern serial killers sexual serial killers in opinion of most of the surgeons who examined the body most believed that the killer had to have some degree of anatomical knowledge to do what he did and there were huge arguments over this i would have thought it would have been absolutely vital to know what was going on in somebody's body he removes um, kidneys and wounds and all sorts given the time circumstances of the crimes often in near total darkness keeping one eye out for the approach of others yeah well they had to have an accomplice and under extremely tight time constraints the ripper almost certainly would have had some experience in using his knife so a whole pile of letters were sent and some have been totally discounted some have been lost and some are just absolutely fascinating and were probably sent from him um bruce robinson thinks that a, a lot more than um they admit to were sent to um various police officers and and the, he also sent stuff to news desks So there was no forensic ever, no forensic medicine at that time. Or fingerprinting. Yeah. So you had to catch them in the act or get them to confess. So they had their work cut out, you know, and it was a nightmare and they just didn't do it. It just went from bad to worse. And at one point to, um, police forces were involved because I think one of the murders was within the walls of the city of London so they got their own police force and they wouldn't coordinate and it was just mayhem and um, this guy just got away with it right under their noses and those at the top knew who it was so there were blocks in all directions So here's the, the, the victims. These are their post-mortem photographs, obviously. It's Mary Ann Nichols. 
so she was 30 to 35 years old five foot two brown eyes dark complexion five front teeth missing small delicate features and an alcoholic yeah so then they have some history about her and I mean the people on this forum you've got to give them their due they've really you know done a lot of research Annie Chapman so Annie was four, five foot tall not very tall 47 years old pallid complexion blue eyes excellent teeth but probably missing two had a drinking problem but she did have tuberculosis and dying could have had syphilis yeah then it's got you know here she is when things were going okay apparently but was it is it you know you don't know the backstories that they've given these women you know like let's have, have a look Mm. Yeah, okay. Elizabeth Stride. Now this um this is the first one of the two that were killed at the same time. She was from Sweden. She was 45, light grey eyes, pale complexion, curly dark hair, all her teeth were missing in her lower left jaw. She was five foot five. Called her Long Liz. So she's a prostitute in Sweden and she comes over here. Hmm. And this is the second one she was found later. Catherine Eddowes. Now this is the lady I became fascinated with. I, I just became fascinated with her. I think it's well I know it's because um, two day two or three days before she was found murdered she'd returned from hop picking in Kent because that's what they used to do they used to go down travel down to Kent to pick hops my mother comes from that area and she's but one of the um, not non-canonical victims has the same surname as my family my father's side and comes from that area of Lancashire as well so who knows it's, it's just one of those strange weird things it's nothing to do with the actual ripper it's more connection with this woman I don't know what it is so she was five foot tall she was from Wolverhampton at the time of her death she um, had a tattoo in blue ink she had Bright's disease a form of uremia friends spoke of her as intelligent scholarly but one who possessed of a fierce temper but look at the clothes she was wearing this is a woman who was itinerant and just wore all her clothes bonnet jacket skirt vest bodice petticoat skirt skirt she didn't have any knickers on men's lace-up boots bits of paper bits of um, materials and then she had all her possessions with her she just had everything with her yeah and here's her history but her story is fascinating we'll come back to Catherine Eddowes and then last but by no means least Mary Kelly now Mary Kelly was um, 25 so she was young five foot seven and well built blonde hair blue eyes fair complexion uh, so she was um, said to have been possessed of considerable personal attraction so she was a pretty girl and she had her own place it was um, in a place called um, Miller's Court and she usually lived with somebody but he'd gone off somewhere and um, somebody came around to get the rent or something 
looked through the window and saw a horror show. And it just could, I mean, the inquiries into her, this was, you know, this, things were covered up, things were removed, stuff was misinterpreted, uh, it's insane photographs turned up that shouldn't have been taken obviously things were moved about it's very very bizarre and strange dodgy and weird right suspects but all of it all of it just stinks of ritual to me every one of the murders i think that's what i got from it at the start that it was ritual but I didn't know anything about Freemasonry and things like that then. And I, I did see a reference to it. I have seen a reference to it before Bruce Robinson's book came out. But he just gets it, you know. So here's the main suspects. <sighs> Lewis Carroll. Yeah. Who wrote Alice in Wonderland? Carl Feigenbaum, Montague John Druitt, Jill the Ripper, thought it might have been a woman, James Kelly, he was um, somebody who knew Mary Jane Kelly, and the name Kelly is really significant, there's a lot of Kellys, and although they say there's no evidence to knew, to, to say that the women knew each other, um, if you look at the map, right this street here flower and dean street is a house where lots and lots of lodging houses were and catherine eddowes lived here mary jane kelly lived here that's where she was killed so they all lived in this area and there's evidence to show that they all and some of the other people uh, non-canonical women had lodged there and it's not a very big street and they're all in and out of each other's houses and pubs and you know they all shared the same clients of course they knew each other it's ridiculous obviously ten bells pub that's where everybody hung out yeah i think one of them was killed walking back from here i think annie chapman had been there and was on her way back brick lane i was there the other week I was in Ripperland. It's a strange place. So this is the guy that me and my dad really decided was it. We thought this is it. But I was a bit, I don't know. Basically, he was a well-known cotton merchant in Liverpool and um, he married an American heiress called Florence and she was about 20 years younger than him and he had a terrible arsenic addiction. She had a couple of kids with him and then um, got sort of like a bit flighty and ended up having an affair with his brother Edwin. He also had a second family on the go that turned up years later with the appearance of a very, very strange diary purportedly written by him and telling of his Ripper exploits. Now, his wife, Florence, was set up um, with his murder. And what happened was he was an arsenic addict. His brother, Michael, turned up from London and within about a month he was dead uh, quite horribly from arsenic poisoning she was charged with his murder I think she did about 15 years in prison before they released her because it was just completely rubbish and set up so they go into it in quite a lot of depth here so yeah so his brother who came up from London Michael was um, a very very famous composer of popular music he was like the Elton John of the day and he had rooms in the east end of London in that area and 
James Maybrook used to go down to see him sometimes and that's how they sort of say they said when he was down seeing his brother he he did this stuff you know but how about the brother you know why did nobody ever think the brother well because the brother was like Mr I'm up at the top of the box and a Freemason to boot they were both Freemasons they tried to write him out of it but Bruce Robinson finds him yeah Freemasonry is huge in this so Michael Maybrick turns up he's dead within a month from arsenic poisoning and years later he marries one of his servants who I think was the housekeeper to him yeah it's a very very interesting story So, the book. Bruce, Bruce Robinson nails Jack the Ripper. So Bruce Robinson has been researching the Jack the Ripper mystery for over 15 years. Robinson thinks Michael Maybrick is responsible for the horrific murder of five women in the East End of London in late 1888. Bruce Robinson is reported to have said, I honestly think I've nailed the horrible effer. There's my, there's, right, so <laughs> when I do some reading from his book, which I will, I'll read some stuff about the Freemasons, he does swear, he doesn't hold back, he has some blinds, he, he gets quite cross with it all. So Robinson de details his theory in his new book, They All Love Jack, Busting the Ripper. The book is promoted with the following write-up. We All Love Jack is an absolutely riveting and unique book demolishing the theories of generations of self-appointed experts, the so-called ripperologists, to make clear, at last, who really did it and more importantly, how he managed to get away with it for so long. So basically, Robinson's book is not just about his search for Jack the Ripper, it is also critical of the Victorian establishment. It examines the role played by Freemasons. Allegedly, Robinson can identify 330 Tory MPs as Masons from the 360 or so elected at the time. Robinson goes on to explain some of the rituals performed by Jack the Ripper were consistent with Masons. Robinson is sure Sir Charles Warren knew Jack the Ripper was a Mason, even if he didn't know his identity. And um, I think it is important to say that they may not have known. They may have all been suspecting each other. You know, God knows. I mean, who do you trust? <laughs> <laughs> if one of you goes bad and you're Freemasons, I mean, whoa, yeah. So, yeah, um, I think I've just about covered what I wanted to do for this part of it. Um, we'll go back and look at the book in second part, okay? So, if you got this far, thank you very much for watching.